Welcome back to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. If you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this podcast has been dedicated to interviewing people who also wrote about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their pasts. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps this show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. That goes a long way to help. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description. And as always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. Uh, Today I have with me an incredible young lady who's done some really amazing things. She's actually the owner of two book-related businesses, so you you can already see why she's on the show, but she's got an incredible story of her own. Welcome to the show, Nancy Erickson. Thank you, Amanda. I absolutely, uh, I know that my audience can't see it, but I love your background. You've got all these books and everything. It's so colorful. It's absolutely beautiful. There's so much character and personality in what it is that you're doing. Uh, But let's start with who you are from the very beginning. So where did you grow up? Where are you originally from? Oh, well, I grew up all over. Uh, We, my dad, we moved every nine months to three years when I was growing up, but I consider myself as being from Tulsa, Oklahoma, because that's where I went to three years of high school, which is the longest place I ever lived anywhere. So I'm an Okie. <laughs> well, my husband's from Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about kind of your background and what what was it that you had to live through that kind of propelled you in the direction that you've headed in with your life? You know, it it's interesting that like when you're living in a traumatic situation, you don't really realize it because that's your only normal that you've ever seen. But my father was an alcoholic um, and he wasn't violent. Well, he was later. Um, But when I was a little tiny girl, I just knew that he got mad a lot for reasons that I never understood. And so I always felt threatened. Like I always had that kind of lump in my throat. Like, am I going to get in trouble? In fact, one of my earliest memories is hearing having my mom call my name and me just freezing up and thinking, what did I do? What did I do? You know, and she was just talking to me. And so uh, we, uh, we didn't have carpet in our house. We had eggshells. And so we were always tiptoeing around him. And um, you know, one of the things that was difficult as a child is this uprooting all the time, all the time, you'd make a friend and then you wouldn't have that friend. And, you're always the new girl standing in front of class, getting introduced again and again and again. And because we didn't have any roots at home because it didn't feel safe and I didn't have any roots in the community with friends or their mothers or Girl Scout leaders or any permanence in my life, I just ended up diving into the world of fantasy and books. And I read all the time all the time. And um, I can remember, uh, this is when I was in the sixth grade. Where do we live then? We lived in Deerfield, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And I can remember going in the library and my, and thank goodness there were a few adults who could recognize some things in me that they wanted to help develop. And so the librarian got to be friends with me and she told me that she wanted me to be the evaluator for new books that they were thinking about carrying in the library. And so I thought felt very privileged, but <laughs> you know what? She didn't need me to evaluate these books. She wanted me to read these books. So she was giving me like Ernest Hemingway books and things like that and making wanting my opinion on them and should they carry them in the library and things like that. And so that's how I got fed really good literature. And so um, I, I laugh about that and now in retrospect, because it was, it was a little bit of a trick on me, but good, you know, a good (laughs) trick for me. And I do remember my my sixth grade teacher told me I was smart and nobody had ever told me that before. I didn't know I was smart. And so then I started living up to being smart and all. So 
anyway, um, things kind of things progressed uh, with my dad's alcoholism. There was a violent incident at one point where I got pretty battered up um, pretty badly. And it, it set up a whole dynamic, not that event, just the family dynamic of me not really being able to speak up for myself and, um, you know, entering into marriages that were not healthy. Um, my first husband, we were married for 22 years. That's a really long time. Our oldest was in college and our youngest was just graduating high school. And I found out that he had a whole secret life and it was completely incompatible with marriage. He was addicted to pornography and had been hiring prostitutes all the entire marriage, you know, and at the time this was, uh, this was like in 2000 is 20 years ago, but, um, you know, I was had some very real concerns for my health and, <laughs> you know, things like that. And I was shattered. I was shattered by that. Yeah. And that's when I started drinking myself and I just, I couldn't handle anything. I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't believe what had happened to my life. And I thought I've been a good girl the whole time. And what is this? How did I get this? And so I started drinking and I married a man who was, seemed to be my rescuer. But when you think somebody's rescuing you, you really better be careful. Because a couple of days after we got married, he became abusive. And it was um, initially a lot of verbal abuse, a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of gaslighting, a lot of lying. And, and I actually didn't know that there were people like this because I did the people that I had always been involved with. They at least kind of told the truth, you know, except about the big, great secret, you know, but this guy, I, I always say he lied when he didn't even have to <laughs> about ridiculous. And anyway, so, um, I ended up leaving him when the FBI came and raided for child pornography. And I had tried to leave him a couple of times before and had moved out. And he, you know, people like this get dangerous when you leave. And so then I'd go back and, and then I was stuck. So, you know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, how awful that this last thing happened. And I can't tell you how happy I was. I was so happy. I, I could finally get out. That was it. That was the obvious it last thing I could get away from him. And even then it took five years to get divorced because he kept suing me for other things that were not true. You know, he, for one, right. one thing he sued me for was for libel. Cause I'd said he was under investigation for child pornography, which he was, but you know, people can use the courts against you to tear you down and and just yeah fry your brain and you know what and this this was so traumatic to me I mean I would reach up in my hair you know how you do sometimes and just put your fingers through your hair right hand folds would come out because of the stress and the anxiety uh. and so um anyway um I want to go back to the alcoholism for a minute if I can because I I did start drinking I drank for three years alcoholically. And then I got into a 12 step program. And on a week from today, I will have been sober for 17 years. So yeah. So, so, but, but, but much of that marriage, I wasn't drinking and, and that's when he got worse and, or else my eyes got opened. I don't know what it was, but I have um, worked in my, in my business, my original career was in high tech and I had was a systems engineer for IBM and I worked for Oracle corporations, but about, it's been about 18 years ago, uh, my dad was diagnosed with the terminal brain tumor. And so I quit everything and I didn't really like my job, but I was making a ton of money, like multiple six figures. And so I quit everything when my dad was dying and went to be with my mom and dad for that seven months. And when I came back, I just, I just want to throw in here how you can always reinvent yourself. You can always be in the midst of something horrible and just grasp one little ray of sunshine and keep following that. And that's what I did. I, um, and this is in the middle of the bad marriage, right? So I, um, 
when I got back, I thought, well, I, my kids were out of college then I was, uh, how old was I? I was about 45 years old and my kids were out of college. <laughs> so, so I, um, I thought I don't have these financial, um, pressures on me, you know, cause we were done with college and stuff. And I thought I always loved to read and write. I always loved books. And so I ended up going back to school and I got a master's of fine arts at a university here in St. Louis where I live. And then when I graduated, they asked me to join the faculty and teach writing. That's the advantage of being an older student. They're like, <laughs> oh, you're pretty good. You could probably teach this. So, so I did that. And at the same time, I started my publishing house, which is called Stonebrook Publishing. And there's a little, there's a backstory to that because I was only drawn to nonfiction when I was in getting my master's degree because people's real stories are sometimes harder to believe than fiction and people's real grit and tenacity and ability to overcome, especially women. Women are so freaking strong. We are able to overcome and reinvent ourselves and then be that helping hand. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to build a publishing house around that. And so I looked around and I thought, there are so many problems in our world that we can hardly even name them anymore, much less solve them. But I really believe that the answers are trapped inside of people like you and your listening audience. And that when you simply tell your story and what you've been through and what you've overcome and what you've learned and what you've gleaned, then you become the source of two things that people can't live without. And those two things are hope and help. And, and that's what I wanted to build. That's what I wanted to publish. That's what I wanted to help people with. And so crazily, the first book we published was written by a Holocaust survivor who had gone to school with Anne Frank. And we ended up doing our that book release at their school in Amsterdam. And they had this beautiful ceremony there at that school for the 177 students that the Nazis had murdered. And the only two things that were still in existence in that neighborhood, the same time as the Nazi occupation, was that school and then across the street, the bookstore, the same bookstore. And so they did this gorgeous ceremony. It was all in Dutch. I couldn't understand it, but it was very <laughs> emotional. And then we went across the street and did the book release. And then the second book I published was a book about an incredible overcomer woman. She was a quadruple amputee. She had been simply wrapping Christmas presents down in her basement and the doorbell rang. And when she ran upstairs, she banged her hand on the door jam. Big deal. I banged my son. I banged my, all around all the time. Well, as a result of that, she had both her legs, her left hand, and all the fingers on her right hand amputated. A strep germ had gotten propelled into her bloodstream and went septic. So anyway, oh. we got back cover endorsed. Along the way, she met up with Heather Mills and Paul McCartney when they were married, and they brought her over to England to get her prosthetics made her legs and such. And so anyway, we got back cover endorsements for that book from Sir Paul McCartney and Cindy Crawford, the supermodel. And so I was like <laughs> thinking, look, I've only done two books. This is really good. I think this is really good. <laughs> but there was, there was a real problem though, <clears throat> Amanda, excuse me, just like, <clears throat> pardon me. The problem was we were getting so many manuscripts submitted to us that had a seed of that thing we wanted to do, which was to publish material that would either save lives, change lives, or transform society. But they were so poorly written, we couldn't do anything with it. You know, we couldn't edit our way out of them. And wow. that's, you know, and, and then I'm like, but I still felt responsible for that author's message. I thought, so what if they can't write? Does that mean they can't be heard? And I, it, it just really weighed on me. And um, 
I ended up taking a step back and didn't publish anything for a year. And so I wrote this very step by step by step by step process that would take a person who's not a writer through an, from their idea all the way through um, framing up their book and developing the structure and writing the first draft and editing and, and you know, then taking it all the way through the publishing house to publish it so that that so that, you know, what I say is we help people aren't who aren't writers become authors of high impact nonfiction books. Wow. I love that. You know, I've had several people reach out to me and say, hey, I know you wrote your story. Can you write my story, too? I always yeah. tell them I can't. I would not be able to do justice to your story like you can, but there are people out there and there's programs out there. And now I know of you, Nancy, that can help these people to figure out how to put their story into words. You know, and it's so easy. It is so easy when you just do that one thing you have to do that week. Cause like what we start off with is a series of what I call foundational questions. And those are things that are intended to help you crystallize your message. And so there are things like, you know, why are you even doing this? You know, what is your motivation for this? Who specifically is your audience and how will they be changed as a result of um, taking in your message? And so we just week by week, we just add a little bit to it, a little bit to it, a little bit to it. And you'll, we don't, you know, sometimes I think what you might be referring to is ghostwriting. Some people want other people to write their stories. Right. They can't, they cannot do that because you're the only one who has your story and you're the only one who can do it, but you can do it. You just need to be led through a process that'll get you from point A to being published and having your book distributed around the world, which is what we do. But, um, you know, I've worked with so many people. I work with a couple different types of people. A lot of people are writing business books. They want to expand their business or become professional speakers. And they want to have that product or tool to help advance them. But my favorite group to work with are the ones I call overcomers. And those are people who have been through something. It was hard. It was hard because they didn't have any help. They didn't have anywhere to turn. They were lonely and struggling. And it was really you know, a, you know, it's so hard when you're in that position. It's so hard. I can remember people would say to me, well, what doesn't kill you will make you grow stronger. And you know what I thought to myself? That's such a lie. <laughs> you know what I thought? I thought I'd rather die than be doing this. I'd rather die. I'd rather die than have to deal with this man and the way that he is has destroyed me. Right. And, I, and, and he doesn't deserve the credit for making you stronger. No. It, yeah, anyway, so I don't know whoever came up with that, but don't Frederick Nietzsche in the 1800s. It what? was actually Frederick Nietzsche in the 1800s. And then he later died in an insane asylum. So a little okay. bit of not well-known history when it comes to that phrase. I talk about that often when I'm on stages, we can yeah. let that one go. It is not yeah, our abusers. It is not our go. past that makes us stronger. We already had the strength within us. We just had to dig a little deeper to find it. That's right. That's right. And, and it, it's really hard. And plus when you're in that lonely, desolate, desperate place, it's the dark night of the soul. Yes, it is. And, and the only way through it is through it. And it's awful every day until one day it's just like a little less awful. Yeah. And then there is a miracle that happens with time that if you just keep moving forward and doing the next right thing that you can walk out of it. But for me, it took 10 years, right? It took 10 years to get out of that. You know, that it took five years to get the damn divorce, you know, and we didn't even want to be together. I mean, it was just, it was a way to torment me. And, um, but um, I have seen so many people take, you know, they say, turn your mess into the message. That's a little bit trite, but I have seen so many people that I've worked with take this deepest pain that they've experienced and turn it into something that will actually 
where they can stand where they are and just kind of turn around and reach back their hand and pull the next person up. And that's the beauty of your story is that your story can do the same thing, but it can only do it if, if you, you know, write it. And, you know, you have to go through a little bit of reliving things when you're writing about them, but that's okay. And here's what's really cool, Amanda, is that so many people that I have worked with, when they got their book, when they started writing it, and, and they got their book down and we got to the point where it was a finished manuscript and we edited it. They had told their story for the final time and it was so cathartic. It was so therapeutic that they were like, this is what happened. And now I'm better despite that and, and strong. And it, it, it it's a very healing process. I'm working with one man right now. He's a, an incredible, um, brilliant, well-known business person who grew up in the foster care system. And that's a rough life. You know, I was a foster kid woman who, um, she had a, a, was in a car accident and had a traumatic brain injury at the age of seven and everything that has fallen out after that. I've worked with another woman whose book has done amazingly well. She's been on the Today Show and USA Today and stuff like that. But hers is about her experience where her husband was, they were both brilliant MIT, grad, you know, educated. I mean, like way beyond normal people smart, you know, <laughs> and he was starting to forget things like the garage code and he got lost and all kinds of stuff. And the doctor said early Alzheimer's and she was like, oh, I don't believe that he's too young. There's no history. And she's like a researcher, you know, so he declined, 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 finally was had put in nursing care. And after her digging for so long, they, she discovered, they discovered that the source of it was Lyme disease. And if he had had the protocol right away in the beginning, when she suggested it might be Lyme and they didn't listen to her, he would have been fine, but he died. He passed away about a year ago. Wow. But you know what she's doing? I mean, you guys, she's 40. She was 40 when her husband died. Oh my gosh. She is now developing a testing protocol for Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. She started a medical tech company and they are making incredible break for breakthroughs. And wow. yeah, it was a horrible tragedy for her, their kids and everything. Their kids are still elementary age. Oh my gosh, but, um, poor baby. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I just- that whole thing about reinventing is real. And you may not, it, when you're in the middle of it, you don't realize that, that that's what you're doing. But you're, when you take, you don't know, because you're just doing survival things, right? Right. right. From one day but to the next. These, whatever these survival things are, they're moving you forward. And, but we don't want to be survivors. We want to be overcomers. And so you don't want to get stuck there. And so the way to propel yourself forward is to tell your story. Right. And I found, you know, from personal experience, when I was able to write things down, even if it was just a small portion of my life story, once I was able to get it down, not only did I recognize the strength that I had within me to be able to move beyond what it was that I had survived, but I then had a physical body that it was that was separate from me and I could set it down and walk away from it. It was no away. longer part of the forefront of my thoughts, but rather it's always going to be a part of my life. It's just now sitting on a separate shelf. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not carrying it around with you anymore. That's kind of what I was saying about it being a cathartic experience for people. Yeah. Once they got it out, it was like, that's the last time I'm telling my story. I'm not telling it anymore. Here it is because this is it. Right. And it, and it's, it's, you know, very healing. I kind of went the opposite route. I wrote my book and then became a public speaker, but yes. <laughs> having written the book gave me the ability to become the public speaker because I got all of the, the horrible, really nasty parts of it out of me. And then right. I could finally learn how to talk about it. Yeah. And that was, you know, and I, I want to say something else about trauma because it's also also closely associated with shame that we carry. 
And um, so I'm married again. I'm married to an incredible man. He's so, he's so cool. We're really, really good friends. But for a long time, I felt a lot of shame about being married three times. But you know what? I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do those things. Why, why would I? carry that around with me you know i might be have been too trusting or naive but that's not a sin you know that's not a you know you're supposed to trust the person you're married to (laughs) but you know and i i also carried a lot of shame about um alcoholism and, and and all but I'm not anymore. I mean, I mean, a lot of people are anonymous about it. Obviously, I'm not because I tell everybody on podcasts and my books and in my work, all along, everything. But, you know, that is also a genetic inherited thing. And you should only be ashamed of it if you don't do anything about it. Right. And 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 so I, just a little bit about shame is I think shame keeps people from telling their story. And even if you have done something that you regret in your past so what who hasn't you know you can still share those things and get it off of you get it off of your back and like you said put it on a shelf yeah absolutely you can walk away from it all so what did you do to be able to move beyond all of that i mean what were the most helpful things that you found to be able to move beyond uh, the childhood abuse, the husband abuse, the alcoholism. What got you through all of this to where you well, are now? For alcoholism, I joined a 12 step program and still go three times a week. And they're all my friends. And, you know, everybody's been sober. Like I'm the newbie at 17 years, you know, everybody else is wow. like 30. But yeah, um, I did do a lot of therapy, but I didn't find that I felt really helped until I went through something called the Hoffman process. And I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm-hmm. It's an intensive in-person, well, it's an intensive, like, all I can say, experience where it's, they take you through a series of things that helps you to release everything and all the anger, all the bitterness, everything inside of you. And there's some physical components too, where you get it out of your body and, and all, and it was life transforming for me. And it has been for a lot of people. Um, and, and then therapy. And then, you know, I got, I got back involved in my faith and found some comfort there. Uh, and I think mainly, I think the hardest part is the day to day when you're in it. And so I, I, I was very concentrated on the fact that I would always tell the truth in a situation where someone's lying about me and, you know, that I would always tell the truth. I would, would be honest and I would do whatever I needed to do that day to get through the day. And I don't know when it got easier, but it did at some point. And even when I look back, I'm like, I kind of think like, well, what was the turning point on that? And I had some really <laughs> rather fun times in court where my husband at the time was saying, she never earned a cent during this marriage. And then I flipped out our W-2s and I'd made more money than he did, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So, so, but, you know, I, I thought I, those kind of situations, you can lose yourself and do things that aren't really you. And so I was really glad that I made that decision that I would tell the truth because I, I, and, and about all where everything was and what I had and everything and that, um, you know, so I don't have any regrets at all about the way I handled myself through all that. Yeah. But the other thing is, is that there's kind of this other weird component that you can't bleed on everybody all the time. So there's a solo journey that you're going through or else you're going to kind of drive people away and um I had a lot of anxiety I mean I had because I quit drinking so I didn't have that mechanism to work with but I um you know I would pour things out with my therapist and I had some different kinds of modalities of therapy I had one time I 
uh, had a, a series of sessions called EMDR, which mm-hmm. it's a, a a wonderful thing with lights or with uh, even we had some buzzer things that we held and stuff that I would describe. I would do this before I had to go to court with this man. And um, you know what the thing is that I think that did is that I'm not a bitter person. I'm not mean and I'm not non and I still trust people and stuff. But I came out of all of that. And I think this is thanks to the the EMDR feeling really bad for that man, for being who he is, for living the life that he does. I'm not angry at him. I don't feel like I mean, I, I don't feel victimized. I feel just I'm sorry for you kind of thing. And, and so that kind of therapy helped because it helped to release the deep seated, you know, things that you can bury. Right. And all. So, um, I found that, that to be very helpful in talk therapy. And then I had another therapist who, and it sounds like I jumped around a lot and maybe I went to one for one thing and then I took some breaks and then I went to someone else, but who took me through a lot of visualization exercises that where I could see myself as I really was, which is a strong, competent woman and help reframe my own image of myself that had been so destroyed. Wow. Now EMDR was very helpful for me. I'd never heard of it before I started going through it. And it just, it was surprising how helpful it was. And it seems silly because you're watching this light track back and forth. You're like, what are we doing (laughs) now? Yeah. But it yeah. triggers something in your brain and it's <laughs> so helpful. Well, we only have a few minutes left. So I want to make sure that, have you got a little bit of your book that you would be able to read for us real quick? Yeah, I thought what I would do because my book is called Stop Stalling and Start Writing. And it's my story blended in with how I can help you the you know to write your own book and why you might do that. But I'm going to read a little bit from the, the preface if I could. So here goes. A few years ago, I completely stopped watching the news on television. The reason was that I'm an INFJ, the rarest type of the 16 types on the Myers-Briggs type indicator assessment. As you probably know, the Myers-Briggs test helps people gain insights about themselves and how they react to the world. One of the hallmarks of INFJs is that we, quote, abhor violence. A poor is a pretty strong word, but it hits the nail on the head with me. My husband, Tom, makes fun of me when we watch a movie together and something violent happens. I throw my coat over my head, plug my ears, and hum to myself until the scene is over. But now he gets it. Violence is an assault to my soul, and I can't bear it. When I watch the news, it's always negative, filled with terrorist attacks, racial violence, bullying, natural disasters, global warming, etc., and I had to stop taking it in. But my aversion to television news doesn't mean I'm uninformed. I catch the news on the radio or find it online where it doesn't affect me as deeply as when I viewed it. Yet I often feel completely overwhelmed by the complex problems in our world. We have so many problems that we don't even know how to name them anymore. But we do know what doesn't work. Top-down solutions don't work. Government can't fix anything. Organized religion hasn't solved our problems, and heaven knows we've tried to medicate our problems away. In many cases, these attempts have not only complicated the original problem, but have spawned entirely new ones. There is a solution. I believe that our problems, all of them, can be solved and that the answers are trapped inside people like you. When you share what you know and what you've learned, then you become the solution. Oh, beautiful. I already know somebody that I'm going to be giving your book to uh, this year as a Christmas present and probably Christmas in August. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So for people that are looking for you, I do have links for your LinkedIn, for your thebookprofessor.com and for your stonebookpublishing.net. All these are going to be in the episode description. Is there anything else that you can think of that you would like to add in there for anybody? I would. I'd like to tell you that I am, I would love to talk to you about your book ideas in your life. So if you go to my website, thebookprofessor.com, across the top navigation, there's a link that says schedule a call with Nancy. And we'll just jump on a Zoom call and we'll talk about what you're 
thinking about writing and I can kind of vet your idea and give you a little bit of guidance, but um, you know, that's the first step. And, and you can be brave. You can do that. <laughs> you can yeah. schedule a call. And if you I'm schedule that call, you'll be able to see Nancy's really cool background with all these books and everything yeah. on her wall. So yeah, super cool. So there's always one last question that I ask my guests. It's my favorite question. This is how I love to end every episode. So I'm going to let you have the final word with answering this one question. What is your favorite thing about yourself? That's not related to your physical appearance. I like that I wake up happy every day. I just have joy in my heart. And I and, and it's so much joy to me to help other people do what they want to do. And it just, you know, my work is like play to me. So I embrace joy. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you'll find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted. I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash growth from darkness.